is setting out the coming year. Uh, as you know, we've had a few problems with Zoom in the past, but Andrew and Ken and Sheila have been working hard to get it going. And we do have some participants this afternoon, so I hope it will all work really well. And uh, hello to them, although I don't think they can hear me yet. Um, short AGM next month, followed by um, an update on the 1921 census and one or two other things, local research. What we do need, which is a plea really for me and Sheila, we need some more volunteers for our committee. It's not arduous, it's not difficult, it just we need to spread the load a bit, have some new people. Um, so if you think you might be interested, do see one of us today or just come along to the AGM and don't feel you've got to have a proposer and seconder already. We'll do that for you if you just raise a hand at the time <laughs> and we'll make sure. Uh, the other thing we, we're looking at is whether to stick to Thursdays for our afternoon meetings uh, and the evening. Um, if you've got any thoughts about that, do let us know. Are you we, it's w <laughs> no, it wouldn't be the second Thursday. Yeah, We'd have to do the third Thursday. Yeah, we had thought of that. <laughs> yeah, okay. um, we switched from Wednesday because it was lunch club and choir and ukulele and various other things on that day afternoon. Maybe it's easier to keep the same day for the evening and the afternoon, but let us know what you think. So Sheila spent many hours researching um, the graveyard, the churchyard, and despite struggling around with her hip, which she's hopefully <laughs> soon to have mended, um, and we're grateful for Yo Valley for clearing the churchyard recently because it's made it a lot easier. You can now read some of the gravestones and the edges to some of the graves, which were completely hidden before. Um, so this is uh, mostly down to a lot of hard work from Sheila. Thank you. I'm going to do it a bit. They're going to Thank step in a little bit. Okay, I've started with this picture. The large cross in the foreground there is the grave of Lord Winterstoke, who lived in Coombe Lodge. And um, we're not actually going to look at the graves in the lower churchyard very much because they actually only date from 1908. And we're concentrating on some of the uh, older graves in the upper part of the churchyard. But as Lord Winterstoke was responsible for rebuilding the church in 1908, uh, it, I felt he ought to have a presence in this, really. Um, his, he was very much respected by the village, and at his funeral, he was driven through the village on inner beer um, by some of his prized horses, his shire horses, and all the villagers had their uh, blinds closed, as people did in those days. Um, so, And <clears throat> if you look in the high street of Blagden today, it wouldn't be like that without Lord Winterstoke's rebuilding projects all the half timbered houses and so on are due to him. So first of all, I'm going to look at the, um, basically the uh, what's changed in the churchyard because what we see today is not the way it was. Um, this is the old church, as you can see, it's very much smaller than the current one. And so is the churchyard. Um, to the right there is a, a rather nice view of, of um, what is now the close, it was church cottage in those days. Um, and it was very much a small holding um, farming and there's a haystack there with fences around it and so on. And as you can see, the wall to the churchyard is already sort of looking a bit shaky on the edges. And it's it, if you remember what the uh, we've got another slide later showing how the, the close the uh, closest change. So. That's just another view showing the side view of the old church, you can see it was only from the measurements they had when they wanted to extend it, it was 64 feet long. And I don't know what the length of the current one was, but it was uh, considerably larger than that. And here's the what they were planning to do. Um, basically, the, there was only one aisle in the old church in 1821, and the proposal was to increase it by adding another aisle, which was going to be 14 feet wider. Um, Thomas Roweth was the church warden at this time, along with Richard Paynes. And, of course, in order to do that, they had to move some of the graves. And this is a, a receipt from, uh, I know it's difficult to read, but it's a receipt signed by the Mark of James Lemon, who had been uh, nine days and a half labour digging new graves to receive the corpse and bones. Uh, can't read that. What's it say? Uh, the box remains. Yeah, to make way for the foundations of the new aisle and um, arising. So it, uh, he was paid 
two shillings a day, and it was nine and a half days, so he got 19 shillings. And it's signed by, um, no, he hasn't got the church wardens the, the thing on that. So, and Mary Small, who's on there, was actually the housekeeper to Thomas Roweth. So basically, those are the two churches. The 19, the uh, 1822 church didn't last very long. People didn't like it. Um, it wasn't large enough, and it wasn't until Lord Winterstate came along in 1908 that it was demolished and rebuilt. And you can see <clears throat> the churchyard has now been extended. This was due to the generosity of Mary Newnham, who was the uh, owner of Blagden Court. And she generously gave that land and also paid for the wall to be built around it, um, which made a huge difference. And this, uh, and buttresses were added to the wall in 1913 because it was starting to, uh, to give way a little bit. And there's the close. Uh, in its new form, it was extended. Mrs. Newnham, um, Mrs. Lambrick moved to the close after the death of her husband in 1929, and she had it hugely extended with a new wing and so on. Unfortunately, she wasn't didn't stay al wasn't alive for very long to enjoy it. But uh, anyway, so there's the churchyard as it is. Um, and we're going to look at these sort of documents in order to find the information we want. Um, there's some quite useful reports of inquests and um, uh, funerals and so on in newspapers. And inquests in these days were quite different than they are today. This is just an example of uh, a problem they had when a Robert Day um, was found collapsed in Blagden Coombe and um, they had a bit of a problem knowing what to do with him. <laughs> Normally they held inquests in the local pubs, but he wasn't a man for, he was from Burrington. So there wasn't, they couldn't sort of take him home. Um, and they, they first attempted to take him to one of the pubs and they were refused. And then the policeman thought it would be jolly good if they put him in the church porch. And that didn't go down well with the church wardens. So in the end, they went to the Seymour Arms. And it's interesting looking at the outcomes of various um, inquests. One of the, if you died of some sort of heart seizure or something, then that was called death by visitation of God. If you, um, uh, sort of things like old age were gradual decline, and even as a youngster you could decline, but that was often due to cancer or TB. It basically meant you'd had a long sickness. Um, so... So now I'm going to hand over to Jackie for, to uh, to talk about this family who've got one of the largest monuments in the churchyard. Yes, as I said, Sheila did most of this, but uh, yeah. I'll stand up here. Yeah. Um, I just looked at this particular two. Oh, okay. Yeah. The camera, yeah. um, it's quite striking. If you go under the Lich Gate, it's on your right, and you can see it's quite a large memorial with a, a little fence around it. And it's written on on at least two sides, four sides, I think. Um, and it was a crypt, and you went, went down steps to the underneath. And there were several burials under there. It has been blocked in now, so you can no longer get down there. So, how are we moving it on? Oh, just on that arrow there. Oh yeah. Or so you can use those if you want. Yeah. Okay. So it's hard to read on there, but basically, it's um, the memorial is to a big family and uh, William Ford and his descendants are all remembered on there. We'll come back to them in a minute. This is what it says on this side, memory of William Ford of this parish, his Anne, his wife. Um, the reason it said Knight Ford on it was because she was a knight from Congresbury, his wife. And then it's his various children, John, Elizabeth, William, and then John's um, an un an un another son, Sophia. And uh, on the other side, we've got the rest of the family. Thomas Stevens, who was one of the daughters married to Stevens. And then there's a, several of those. So we've got several different names. Um, <laughs> Knight, Ford, Stevens, and uh, one of the married names of one of the daughters. 
in the church, there's a memorial window, it says in memory of the families, and it says it was erected by an Anna Maria Stevens uh, in 1909. She was a descendant of theirs. And uh, I think there's a detail of the window. Yes, that's the, that's the full window. So that was erected by Anna Maria. We'll come back to in a minute. That was the underneath. It says on there, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. To the glory of God and in memory of the families of Knight, Ford and Stevens, for many generations, residents and landowners of this parish. And the window is erected by Anna Maria Stevens. Um, after she died they, they, in 1924, there was a fund set up which was to keep the window and also for the poor of the parish. But that was eventually dissolved. It's no longer in, no longer in use. This may, oh, one more, yeah. it's maybe a little bit difficult to read. And uh, oh, you probably can see it. So that's the family tree. So we've got William. Um, he died at the age of seventy-one, but he lost his wife when she was only in her forties. She was Anne Knight, daughter of John Knight, Esquire of Congresbury, who was, I think quite a well-to-do person in Congsbury, and she probably inherited some money from him. William had inherited a small amount of land from his father, who was a butcher, but he built on those holdings considerably during his lifetime. And his will lists many buildings, many mess messuages, as they're called, fields and orchards. And his eldest son was also called William, but he clearly needed some care um, because his father set up a fund which would enable his siblings to house him for his life and provide him with clothing, et cetera, during his lifetime. So the son who um, was the next eldest, John, John Gibbard, or sometimes it's written as Gibbard or even Gilbert in the various electoral registers and things, he inherited a good deal of land in the Dipland area, possibly also Orchard House, which was a house in the High Street opposite the Queen Adelaide. And he married a girl also from Congresbury, Sophia, and she died in her 40s. It was such a common thing that the women were dying young. Um, and they had one daughter, Anne. She never married, but she therefore inherited a lot of money from her father. After he died, she moved with her housekeeper, Elizabeth, who'd been also born in Blagden, had been with them for a long time. They moved to Bristol and they remained in Abbotsford Road in Clifton until Anne died in 1930. The daughter Anne, who married a John Culliford in the middle there, was a very interesting woman who we spent quite a lot of time looking at. She inherited a lot of land, including Vale Farm and holdings in Sanford. And in slightly mysterious circumstances, she married a John Young Culliford of Rington. He'd been a wool trader and fellmonger, which means he was a purveyor of skins, and he was in partnership with his father. But their partnership did break up, and in fact, the father went bankrupt. They married. She, he, and Anne married in eighteen twenty-four in Bristol, but there were no witnesses that seemed to be family members. So it, it seemed as if possibly she married without the goodwill of her family. And by 19, 1841, she was back in Blagden possibly renting Ridge Farm in Bourne Lane uh, and caring for her brother, William. Her husband seems to have gone to London and there's never any more contact between them as far as I can make out. And when he finally dies, uh, there's no mention of her in his will. Everything goes to his sister. And uh, I don't know what went wrong, but something did. Um, Anne died at 52 and uh, her younger sister, Elizabeth, died at 44 at Paywell Farm, uh, also unmarried uh, in the same year. They both died in the same year. Vale Farm was eventually sold. Mr. J.W. Paynes, who's uh, Joshua Paynes, uh, was the tenant at the time, and he continued to be, I think. Um, it was auctioned off by Anne's nieces. And I'll just share Anne's will, because that's quite interesting. She said, first, I will and direct that my body be interred under the family pew in the parish church of Blagden in a decent and becoming manner, and that my trustees do cause a suitable monument to be erected to my memory, the cost of which I leave to their discretion. 
perhaps this prompted her daughter, uh, niece, Anna Maria, to do something. Um, she left quite a bit of land, some to her brother, John, and some to her sister, Mary, who'd married Thomas Stevens. But everything else was entrusted to trustees for the benefit of her four nieces, for the maintenance and education or in advancement in life. As I said, Mary had married a farmer, Thomas Stevens. They started off in Blagden, but then they um, moved to Sandford and um, he died there. Mary and the younger daughter, Anna Maria, who's down at the end, um, lived, uh, sorry, no, Mary and Thomas had a daughter, another Mary, um, who continued farming after their retirement. And then quite late in life, she married George Cole, who was her bailiff, um, but beyond the age when she would be having children. And then later, she and her sister, Anna Maria, moved together to Carrington Villa, which sounds quite grand, in South Atlantic Road of Western Supermare. And they each died there in 1902 and 1924. So there were several unmarried women and no heirs that I can see that had the name of Ford. Um, not, and not Stevens by a direct route. There may have been Stevens related to Thomas's other siblings, but there's no direct route to them. So the names on that mon monument sort of dried out, died out. When Vale Farm was eventually sold, um, it was a, a dairy farm and the, the nieces also owned Sage Farm in Buckham, which is another big dairy farm. And they were selling off a lot of land as the sale particular up there. And just up at the top left on, um, up here is Coombe Lodge. Oh, it doesn't show up with this one. Um, it was fairly surrounded by Will's estate land, and he was obviously keen to include it in his land and eventually did. And so Vale Farm became one of the Will's estate. Okay, so that's a little bit about that particular tomb. Back to Sheila. <laughs> So I'm going to walk in a clockwise direction around the churchyard. And first of all, looking at Richard Paynes, who is uh, to the left as you walk through the Lich Gate. Um, this is one of the older monuments in the, in the churchyard. And uh, I'll move on to what's actually on there because it's, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to bombard you with dates throughout, but it's just to show that some of the wealthier families, Richard Paynes owned a lot of land and property in the village, but he, uh, you know, certainly in his early years, he was it was quite unfortunate how he lost a large number of members of his family, um, dying long before their time, really. Um, and it was his son, George, in the second column, who eventually inherited most of the land and property. And he was the man we remember from running the grocers and post office stores in the high street. Um Georgian charity. So, another interesting thing about these graves is going back and go back to look at the grave as a whole. You can see in front of Richard Paynes's grave, the leaning one in the centre, there's a small gravestone. And it turns out these are footers to the graves. They're not independent graves as, as they appear in that picture. They have initials of those who've died on them and a verse underneath. Uh, and there's the verse, which appears on similar ones, um, similar graves in the rest of the churchyard, but I, I haven't seen this before. And the profile of the little grave matches the, uh, the one at the top of the grave. So there we've got, basically we're saying that Jane, Jane Paynes, Jane Paynes the infant, William Paynes, uh, John Paynes, and Richard uh, Richard Paynes all passed away. And then there are some more initials at the bottom because this gravestone was added to after the death of Richard Paynes uh, by uh, by George and Charity and so on. And basically, <clears throat> the one a little gem about Richard Paynes. He unfortunately rushed the uh, turnpike one day. And he ended up having to pay five pounds, which was a lot of money in those days, 
Don't know what made him do it, but he was obviously in a hurry. In the quarter session records. Right. This is James Canth we're moving on to now. I've missed one, actually. I'll go back. This is the one I wanted to look at. These were the houses that were at point, various points owned or occupied by the Paynes family. In the top, we've got West End House. We've got the uh, what was the grocers and post office in the high street. Blagden House was owned by Benjamin Paynes. Vale Farm was tenanted. Um, Station Hill Cottages in the centre was tenanted. Uh, Bell Square was owned by John Paynes and Walnut Tree House was uh, operated as a small farm by um, Joseph and Harriet Paynes. And they also owned um, <laughs> other land, considerable amount of land, and they made a lot of cider, which was often auctioned. Several thousand gallons of cider were, were auctioned every year. So moving on now to this little cross you see as you pass towards the church porch. This was very sad. This was um, James Cann, who was um, accidentally killed by a steam crane. He was, his family were living in one of the temporary huts down by the reservoir, working on the construction. His father was a fireman for the reservoir. And he was um, a hitcher on, and he'd been working there for about a year. Um, and unfortunately he had a habit of riding on the front of the crane and the crane driver couldn't see him, but he attempted to jump off and his foot caught and he fell on the rails and he was run over by a truck. Basically, these steam cranes sat on the what was the, going to be the dam, uh, picking up all the waste earth from when they were digging the puddle gutter, swinging round and dumping it in trucks, which were on rails to take it away. And <clears throat> unfortunately, he, uh, he was run over by this truck. He was taken into hospital um, in Bristol but he died soon afterwards of shock and so on. And um, there was an inquest, an uh, accidental death. But I've traced the family a little bit from when they, because they were obviously jobbing uh, workers. His father was born in Monmouthshire. And after, in 1902, they were over in Wales for a little while. And then they're in Presswick in Lancashire. And the 1911 census tells us how many children people had. And astonishingly, she'd had 15 children. <laughs> <laughs> And living this itinerant life, going around all these places where you built things. And um, out of the 15, six had died. And actually there was another little baby with the name, surname Can in Blagdon, who was only 10 months old, who died. Um, it did, I, where he went to in terms of a grave, I don't know. But 15 children <laughs> living this life. <laughs> and in the hut, she was. there were six children with her and there were three lodgers in this hut. <laughs> and presumably she did all the cooking, you know, so quite a, quite a thing to, to, to cope with. So, right. So moving on, we're going to another vault in the churchyard. This is John Bailey and he and his son, Frederick, owned a huge amount of land, particularly in the high street, including the George Inn, uh, the site of the village club, the... Um, yew tree farm, fir tree farm. Uh, it was a massive amount. And people like John Bailey, who had lots of money, he made his money from being a teasel dealer. And he had lots of money. So he, people like him would offer mortgages to people. And so he was always, he had his finger on the button of what was being sold. And of course, he could foreclose if people couldn't afford to, um, to keep up with the payments. And again, we've got a, a sad list of people who died before their years. Um, we don't know what the 12 year olds and 11 year olds died of, but Samuel had just qualified to be a surgeon and had opened a practice in Kongsbury. And he was coming back from Bristol with his friends, uh, having a bit of a race actually. And he, uh, his, his horse was startled by a coal cart <clears throat> and um, unfortunately threw him off and then fell on him. So he lasted about 20 minutes and that was, that was unfortunately the end of his life which is sad because he just um, qualified to be a surgeon. Um, the other ones lived a little bit longer, but, uh, and Eliza Edgar was um, in uh, living in Western with her husband, Joseph. And all of those names are on that black slab in front of the cross. Uh, 
and right at the very bottom is John Bailey's name. He only just fit, and that was supposed was a vault because when the Edgars were buried in the funeral report, it said they would be buried in the family vault. So presumably after. And the cross at the end is for Frederick Bailey, his son, who was a QC in London. He's not actually buried in Blackton, but it was in memory of him. So. And this is Frederick's, uh, you can just about see on the bottom, it says in loving memory of Frederick Bailey QC. He died in 1987. Uh, so but he was interred in Kensal Green in London. And just to show you the sort of what a difference it made when the estate was finally sold, because all these wealthy people uh, kept this land and their wills usually said that the rents from all the property and land was to be given to their wives for their natural life. And thereafter the property would be sold. <clears throat> so it was a way of giving a pension to their wives really. Um, so you can see from, you can't see terribly easily in here, but basically <clears throat> where it says Clanders Batch in the middle is the start of the high street. So all of this property and land, we've got we've got Yew Tree Farm, the site of the village club, what is now the old parsonage, Yew Tree, <clears throat> Fir Tree Farm, and a lot of land up the hill. And of course, by now, William Henry Wills had moved to Coombe Lodge. And he already owned quite a lot of land, but when this came on the market, it was a, a huge bonus for him. So he, he was uh, it changed the face of the village without without a shape of, without a shadow of doubt, because William Henry Wills, for example, the village club, was built on the corner, um, what had been an old thatch cottage. Um, so moving on, I've now gone round the corner of the churchyard to this little row. Ephraim Wheeler is just at the top of the steps as you go down to the lower churchyard. And it was a double grave, but a particularly attractive um, uh, stonemason's work on there. There's a little mm. ivy going around the outside and flowers in the top. And this was in memory of their daughter, Clara Miriam, who died in 1905, age 19. Um, Ephraim Wheeler had come to the village um, as a stonemason to work on the estate for William Henry Wills. And he'd um, lived in various places, but at one point he lived in Highfield on the, in the High Street, and he let rooms. And that in those days, Highfield was called South View, and that's Ephraim with perhaps some visitors or family in front. This is before it, it was turned into the co-op, if you remember the, the uh, there was a co-op stores there for some time after that. But he was in in Highfield in 1911, and then went back to um, Stone Masonry again. So this is just walking along, parallel with the lower churchyard. Uh, I want to look at a couple of these. Yes, please. Thank you. Thanks very much. Cheers. Thank you. So on the left we. We have Nathan Humphreys, who was the, the village blacksmith. <clears throat> he died in 1903, age 54. And just below him in the lower churchyard is his son, Nathan Humphreys, who was also a blacksmith. Um, and next to him is William Gallup, who is the great, great, great grandfather of John Gallup. And that is one of the best preserved gravestones in the churchyard. It's sheltered slightly by the tree and it has these lead letters in it, but it is uh, it is a beautiful carving at the top and the uh, it's quite legible. Uh, William was a carpenter um, and he worked at the, on the, in land to the, to the left of the Seymour Arms, which is a big uh, carpenter's workshop. Walking along, basically to get to the other corner, the two big gravestones on either side are Harris brothers, their father Charles Harris built um, Dingle Cottage in Street End Lane, and they in they the house was gradually extended to accommodate his son, married sons and so on. The flat one in the middle is Helia Baber, the blacksmith, and he lived in uh, the old farmhouse in Church Street, and he had a blacksmith's workshop there as well. 
And the one in between those two is Jabez Purnell, who was the local policeman. He often appears in uh, in reports of arresting people for being drunk and disorderly in the village. <laughs> so wasn't the most popular man. <laughs> and now I'm going to go into this corner. This this is a the the, uh, the gravestone you can see in the far left is Edwin Trotman. He was the last school teacher to be employed by the board school, and he retired in 1876. Uh, just in front of him are two uh, flat uh, graves that are illegible, unfortunately, but we might try and have a, we're going to try and rub it, aren't we, in uh, one of them to see if we can fathom it out. But the inset one in the middle is this mysterious lady, which quite surprised me when I was looking around. Age 13, resident of the island of Barbados. Uh, I could think, well, what on earth is one person from Barbados with a surname that doesn't belong in Blackton doing here in this corner? And I only found it because I'd started looking in the newspaper reports I don't know if you can read it, but on the right there, a little way down, it says Thomas Roweth Blagden collected at Blagden after a sermon by the Reverend W.G. Strachan, which is her father, uh, <clears throat> which is not her father, actually, but it's the same surname. And they collected £45, so it must have been a very good sermon. And this was destined for the distressed Irish peasantry. So it appears that W.D. Strachan was a curate in the, in the church. And having traced a little bit more of the family back, this was his uh, stepsister, no, half-sister. His father had married twice, and he was uh, from the first marriage. So if you look at this, and this explains what she was doing. At the bottom of there, it is with great regret we state that Miss Anne Strachan, the younger daughter of Dr. Strachan, died of decline two days before the steadfast sales from Bristol. And this is the Barbadian Times. So this was back in, uh, this was reported back over there after they'd returned home. So, and they obviously got in touch with her half brother and asked him if he'd perform the service. And it's even more mysterious because at this point, the church was being rebuilt. And so it wasn't consecrated until 1823. So, how did the funeral take place in 1822? Unless they had a service at the grave, I suppose. Perhaps they could do that. I don't know. But in the burial register, a number of um, fu funerals did take place in 1822. So there must have been a way around it. Perhaps they, you know, they, they could have a graveside service rather than a, a full service in the church. I'm going around to the gentry now a little bit more. Uh, all of these people are associated with Coombe Lodge and Blagden Court. Thomas Festing, there is a, a plaque to him in the tower. He and his wife rented Blagden Court for a number of years. Um, Captain Valpy was a resident of Coombe Lodge. The Newnams uh, were connected with Blagden Court. And Thomas Roweth uh, lived in um, Blagden in Coombe Lodge. So starting with Thomas Roweth, <clears throat> this is a very, you know, quite a respectable team, uh, tomb. And you can see from the picture on the right that there were iron railings around it at one point, which are no longer here. And this was again a vault. And there is a uh, slab next to it, which was the entrance to a vault with inscriptions on it. And when John Miller did um, his recordings of the, of the um, memorial inscriptions, back in 1995, he rec did record an inscription on the top of the entrance to the vault, but it's now vanished. It's not there anymore. Um, so the black plaque in the center records Thomas Roweth on one side and on the other side is his wife, Mary Ann Catherine. And she was a Valpy, um, which is where the Valpy connection comes in. He was uh, a very wealthy man. He had, uh, in Calcutta. A lot of these people are connected by the East India Company. Um, this is a private corporation which was set up to establish a British presence in the Indian spice trade, which until then had been monopolised by Spain and Portugal. And I think the Dutch had quite a lot going on as well. It was founded in 1600 and it dissolved in 1874. 
and the company became immensely powerful. And certainly a lot of the people were coming across here were very wealthy after being uh, in their employ. Um, from the 1600, the company was granted a monopoly on British trade with the East. And during the 18th century, cottons, indigo, porcelain, tea, and silks imported by the company became incredibly popular. They backed a little bit away from the spice trade because everybody else seemed to be doing better in it. It controlled its own army, and which in 1800 comprised some 200,000 soldiers, twice the membership of the British army at that time. And it continued, Parliament continued to control the East India Company because people were getting extremely wealthy out there. And they only extended the charter for 20 years at a time. And certainly during the 19th century, they were reducing the amount of uh, commercial rights and trading that went on. Uh, <clears throat> Thomas Roweth didn't work directly for them, but he did uh, have a warehouse and an auction house on the harbour in uh, Calcutta. And this is just an example of one of the auction statements I managed to find. And you can see it ties in with that little bit of information before. Velvet, certainly a lot of silks and satins and so on. Ivory figures heavily and um, lacquered ware and so on, which came from China. Boats came from all over and he seemed to have bought a lot of the cargo in advance. Sometimes he would take orders, like in the bottom it says, orders for tea and sugar candy will now be received at the warehouse. But it was a, it was a, certainly an incredibly good business. And he was he went over there about um, 1785 and he returned to England um, round about 1808. A wealthy man. So he came to Blackton and lived in, uh, in Coombe Lodge. He was very disappointed with the state of the church. It was in a dreadful state. This is, this is just following the Blagden contro controversy with Reverend Beer and uh, Hannah Moore. And we've, got, we've had the uh, absentee vicar of Dr. Waite, but the church had really been let go. It was leaking in the roof. Um, the there were saplings growing out of the church tower. The church wall was in a dreadful state. And he tried to, to uh, lobby them at vestry meetings, but they didn't take any notice of him. So eventually he was he put himself forward to be a church warden and he succeeded in 1818. And it was he and Richard Paynes who managed the rebuilding of the church. He was successful in applying for a grant from the Committee for Promoting the Enlargement of Churches by saying that they were going to provide an extra 250 seats. Um, which they duly did by partly by having a gallery because you could see that that this is the 1822 church so you can see it was quite small but it had a gallery at the back um, which uh, had pews and seat, seating in it so he died in 1842 <clears throat> and his his wife went to live in Bath for the rest of her life. And it would appear there was a private sale because there was no there was no um, advertisements in the newspaper for a sale. But her, her brother, uh, Captain Al Anthony Valpy, came along um, to take take a place. He had had a, a short career in the navy. In his obituary, all it says was there doesn't appear to be any information after eighteen fourteen. So he had a captain captain a ship at that time, but. Um, it, there doesn't seem to be any more information about him. But he did do a huge amount of work on Coombe Lodge. <clears throat> That's a pencil sketch at the top there, dated 1823, before he, he moved in. And you can see it looks like an entire new section has been added at the back. Uh, he, Captain Valpy and the Newnums were very present at things like local ploughing matches and so on. Um, that it was uh, uh, the nobility got together. They were also all very involved in charitable events and so on. And this is where uh, William Henry Wills came into the picture when he bought it after the death of the Valpies um, in 1880. So a little bit more about who, where they came from. We already know <coughs> Sister Mary married to Thomas Roweth, who's his father, Richard, was the headmaster of Reading School for 50 years. 
And he was um, remembered for writing, he was probably the first person to write several books on Latin and Greek grammar, which were very favored at the time. I don't think anybody had tried to do that before. His brother Gabriel was the rector of um, Bucklesbury Bark and William also, uh, brother William worked for the East India Company. He actually retired to New Zealand and uh, as a farmer, but he worked there for a number of years. And there's the tomb. On one side, it's in memory of uh, Anna, his wife, daughter of Robert Harrison of Reading. And the other side is Captain Valpy. They also cared about their servants and their servants seemed to be, work for them for a considerable number of years. The cross, unfortunately, that's come apart in the foreground is uh, Joseph and uh, Thomas and Jane Adams. And between that and the uh, tomb of Roweth is uh, Charlotte Gill. Sacred to the memory of Charlotte Gill, 44 years working for the Valfi family. And they, all, <clears throat> they other, obviously came from the other side of the country because the Valpies uh, originated in Reading. The name is actually, uh, they were the, <clears throat> the family actually I wondered where Valpi is an unusual name. It's it is actually have Italian origins, uh, and they were based in Jersey for centuries, certainly since the fifteen hundreds. And Thomas Joseph Adams, <clears throat> he was um, that's a picture of of uh, Mr. and Mrs. Adams outside the little lodge house at the end of the original drive of Coombe Lodge, and that's the pedestal where it says again. For nearly 50 years, the valued servants of Captain and Mrs. Valpy. This is the Newnham family. <clears throat> in homage to um, Captain Newnham's uh, time in the Navy, his, uh, there's a little rope uh, and a life belt seen on his uh, grave. Mary Jackson was their um, servant. And General <coughs> George Lambert will come on to in a minute. This is Mr. and Mrs. Newnham at Blankton Court, obviously considerably year after his early years uh, in Bombay. That's the back of uh, Blankton Court, which you don't normally see, which is where that conservatory is. So Nathaniel, he was born in Chichester. Um, his father was in the Navy and had actually served in uh, near the East Indies. His grandfather was Lord Mayor of London, and certainly three of his father's brothers were all involved with the East India Company. He married uh, Elizabeth Foy in Egham. She, her first husband had been killed in Africa. Um, and his the, the tie-in with the family and probably how, how he met her was, um, her widowed mother Mary had married, married uh, Nathaniel's uncle. And this is the William Newman, who is extremely wealthy and very powerful in the East India Company, because he'd worked for the Honourable East India Company for 29 years. And out of that, 20 years he'd spent as a secretary to the government. And he was in charge of a lot of things that went on. He put up 200 guineas for a silver cup for the racers out there. He bailed out the theatre when it was in trouble. And they lived in a very lovely house in um, Egham called Eglinton, on Eglinton Green, called the Bury. It had acres of ground and lots of lovely features about it. And this is Nathaniel. He was, you have to be sponsored to join the uh, East India Company. You couldn't just turn up. You had to have letters of uh, character for, <clears throat> from your teachers from your from the local rector, proof of your uh, baptism and so on. And this is, uh, he was uh, helped by his uncle William to go there. He was 16 years old and he set off for the East Indies to join the army. And uh, his uh, uncle bought him two sets of uniforms. And he said, uh, we've got some correspondence that he wrote to his uncle at the time. And he said he was, uh, his uncle had uh, ordered everything in the handsomest manner and uh, he, nobody in India could be better outfitted. So 
not who's went, but 16 years old off to the other side of the world. <laughs> and this is uh, uh, Mary Jackson, who'd worked for Mary Newnham, uh, William's wife. She had been, uh, she'd been born in Cambridge, actually. So she'd, uh, she'd lived in Egham and then ended up over in this part of the world. So they did look after their staff and they often provided annuities for them when they, uh, from the, in their wills. And Mrs. Um, Mary Newnan, the widow of William, uh, had a house called Eglinton in Clevedon. And it by chance came up uh, for auction recently or came up for sale. And it was on the market for one and a half million. It was a very smart looking house in uh, in Clevedon. And it was interesting how they followed the, the, the route of um, basically, Cle uh, Bath was a favored place to start with. And then they moved to Clevedon, which was sort of up and coming. So, so there we are, that's a summary of Nathaniel's life. He served in Bombay for the Honourable East India Company. He married Louisa. The first, their only child was born in Egham, actually, which is where his uncle was, um, Mary Louisa. He, he then became a tenant of Blagden Court after the Captain Festing had left. Uh, but they've bought it from the Seymour family in 1869. And his daughter, Mary, married uh, Reverend Lambrick. This is where the Lambrick family come in. Both uh, Reverend yeah, General George was actually born in Cornwall and married three times. He, he spent some time in Australia and his first wife, Emma, died there of a fever and he came back to England with a little child. He married his first wife's sister, uh, which was really officially illegal at the time, but it did seem to be happening. Um, and sadly, she died in, in childbirth. And then he married Matilda Menzies in 1860 in Hastings. And this was beyond having children at this age. Uh, and that's where the... George Menzies uh, Lambrick comes from. The Menzies was his uh, last wife's uh, surname. General, he was a general of the Marines. George and Matilda had retired to Clevedon, which is probably where they met the Newnams as well. Um, and uh, the general was very active in the community. So he actually died they moved in um, to Cheddar, where uh, General, uh, where Menzies Lambrick had come back from Stepney and had settled in Cheddar for a while before he came to Blagden. And that's uh, General Lambrick followed him. Um, and that obviously was ended up being buried over here. And then we go to the tomb in the middle there, the Reverend John Sweet, Dr. Sweet. There he is. Another one we've married three times. Women didn't last long in those days. It seemed either childbirth or fevers took you away. Uh, he was rector of Bragdon from 1851. And Henry Barclay Sweet is remembered in this area because he was one of the people who set up the cottage, cottage hospital in uh, Rington. And he and um, Captain Newman were actually uh, one of the starters who went for a mission church up at Charterhouse. They were very active in holding services up there and trying to get things done. He was actually, he and this family were buried in a vault in the church. Um, but uh, of course the church was rebuilt. So they obviously moved the memorial outside. Um, okay. He had actually uh, also, before he came to Blagden, he'd been a chaplain at the jail in Bristol and also at an orphanage. He presented this clock to the church, which is still there. Um, it was an eight day clock and the idea was to regulate the tower clock, which they were still struggling with. Um, it's still in the back of the church somewhere. And there was a window in his memory in the church. He was apparently a tutor to William Henry Wills. And um, it was indicative of uh, what he, <clears throat> William Henry, Henry Wills was very fond of him. So. And, when he died, um, this is this had often happened. They emptied the house. There was a sort of house clearance exercise, 
And apart from the usual rosewood and mahogany furniture and so on, there was a costly rosewood pianoforte, 500 volumes of valuable books, small parlor printing press, which is intriguing. I don't know what he used that for. Noted collection of flowers and plants. He was very fond of his garden. And one of his sons, Horace, actually wrote a book on the flora of England. And it was indicative of the times, a valuable assortment of tulip bulbs, um, true to name, which was important. And he was self-sufficient. You could see his half an acre of capital potato, uh, five sheep, two pigs, fowls and ducks. So they were obviously uh, looking after themselves for the table. And the flowers mentioned were obviously important at the time. There were things like chrysanthemums, amaryllis, azaleas, rhododendrons and so on. So he was uh, certainly lived a full life as man. So now walking back uh, past those graves, just to uh, it's all close the circle, really. These are two sons of Richard Paynes, who we saw at the beginning. Uh, Benjamin Paynes ended up inheriting the business from his father, George, and uh, he ran it for a number of years, taking over the post office. And he was also a church warden. And in the foreground is Joseph's uh, gravestone. And he was in um, Walnut Tree House, as we said before. And this is, again, another set of graves that have headers and footers, if you like. Both all of those little stones are the end of the graves and they match the profile of the big ones in front. I thought that was six graves to start with and I couldn't understand why the little ones only had initials on and no dates. <laughs> so, but apparently that's, that's what they are. And they are beautifully preserved. Looking at some of these gravestones, it's a great shame we don't know who the Masons were because just to wind up, I'm looking at some of the carvings and artwork on these, which are quite impressive, especially when you get close to them. Uh, the detail is phenomenal. Um, the one on the left bottom there is Ephraim Thatcher, who was landlord of the George Inn for a while and very heavily involved in the friendly societies. But the detail is, is quite something. And again, look at this one. This is Samuel, Flower, Samuel Young and his wife Flower. And it, that is quite an early one, and yet the uh, the detail is still very evident. It survived. Unfortunately, the weather we've had over the last five years has made a lot of them deteriorate. The, the uh, limestone is sort of slice dropping off in slices. It's a shame. This this one is um, William Gallup, who we saw earlier. That's a lovely piece of work. I'm coming to the end really now. So life goes on. This is a when I was walking around the churchyard photographing it. And it was lovely to see all these snowdrops and uh, primroses coming up. So that's where I'm up to. <laughs> Any questions? Any questions? The <laughs> headstone and and a little stone. Is that quite a common thing? In I don't know, but I don't know because I've not really gone around a lot of churchyards. Have you? Uh, I, don't, I don't know. It, one of the earliest lives I had, it's, they, someone owned parts of Nenmet, because that's where I am. Oh, yes. So um, I wonder if you know what parts. I can look it up for you because it, what you really need to look is look at the map. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, yeah, I'll have a look at the end. Yeah, I can go back and look at that. Yeah. Was the um, Richard Paynes? Yes. Was he related to Cecil Paynes? No. Who used to, or was it a different money? Yeah, no, Cecil Paynes was a P A Y N E S. Yeah, the builder, yes. Yeah. No. Yes, I was wondering whether the forts you talked about earlier on are related in any way to the forts. Sorry, but no. Yes, they could be. I don't know. Yeah, I don't. I don't they were mostly double O, but obviously Ford is one of those names that gets yeah. spelt. Both ways. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think most of the Fords at Nenton are a single O, aren't they? Yes, yes they are. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, so that's the sort of thing that can get changed over yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of the double O's have dropped over the years, haven't they? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's obviously thousands of monuments in the church, I'll be do That was just uh, one circle round, but there are a lot more. And there is another grave in the churchyard with a header and footer. There is um, 
if I go back to the previous slide, there's one, um, that's the decoration. There is one to um, uh, George Dyer and his wife. And again, that's got the initials um, at the bottom. We were looking at the other day, weren't we? It is, and the, the verse is a bit odd because if you go back to the, well, I have to go back to the beginning, but the verse at the beginning had earth rhyming with death, which didn't quite work. And on one of these is um, is that same phrase on these, uh, not that, not that, the wrong one, that one. Uh, the same uh, little bit of verse is on the bottom of that as well. So I don't know whether the stonemason must have made some money out of suggesting to people that they did this. You know, so. Did it work in dialect? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Can any true Somerset people here who can yeah. make it rhyme? Or else they were very protective of their space because it obviously delimits the far end. And if you haven't got one of those rectangles round, which mm -hmm. um, you show for, then it does actually make the um, make the end of the grave very very obvious, doesn't it? So, yeah. There are a lot of monuments also in the town. Yes. Um, um, but I think one of the many people may not know that the Reverend. Gus's top lady, who wrote for him Rock of Ages, which is in Burrington Coombe, um, is his memorial is in the tower. But since we modernised it, I regret to say it's in the brush cupboard. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. It's sad, actually. Yes, I think Mr. Sweet is uh, HB Sweet. There was a plaque to him, and I think that's in the toilet or in a something. <laughs> Yes, it's a bit sad. Is there a paper vault in the church? Well, if it was by one of these, one of the front pews that were taken out, you can see it very plainly. Yeah, I know that. Do you know what I mean? But I thought when when they pulled down the eighteen twenty two church, that basically they filled in the um the. They they might have moved the monuments, but they didn't move the bones. And there's a stone. There's a yeah, the yeah, there's yeah, one. There is. Yeah, there is. Yeah, yeah I, I don't know whether there's any any because uh, one that one of the problems when they pulled down the uh, church in 1821 was the um, foundations had been undermined by buryings. Yeah. They said nobody was going to be allowed to build it to, to have any more vaults under the under the church floor because it was more or less hollow and none of the pillars were vertical. Mm -hmm. um, it was in a sorry state, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. But it's interesting there are three vaults in the churchyard. That came as quite a surprise. I remember Dick Wood told us that um, the monument that uh, Jackie talked about had steps going down to the crypt and they were filled in when the last person was buried there. But um, I hadn't realised that Thomas Roweth and uh, John Bailey both had uh, vaults as well. That, that one with the um, bars, right? Did anyone there come from... Um... Not that I saw, no. Yeah. Um, yeah. My father always told the story about an ancestor of mine, but I'm not sure which, being brought in a hearse right over Black Mountain Tidings. And I always thought the colour on that monument was maybe connected up there, but obviously it isn't. There are, well, yeah, there is a, there is a Stevens um, or a Wilson. Is it Wilson or Stevens? There is a another grave I came across that specifically mentions tinings. Yeah. Um, well, the Thomas Stevens, who married into the family, I don't know much about him. I think he had several siblings, so maybe... Is it a Stevens you thought was up oh, there? The coal was... A coal oh, coal. And was, and was brought down okay. in the house with horses. Okay. The tinings, my father always spoke... He, when, my father didn't... I don't know that he... Ever saw it, but he knew about it from his father. Oh, okay. So it could be related to the George Cole, who was the bailiff okay. in Sanford. Your father told us yeah. um, that he had seen. Oh, did he see it? Did they go? I don't know if he had any knowledge. I'm going to put at the same problem about the horses. So it would have been in the early 1900s, so. 
Yeah. Yeah. We could look at that. Mm. Mm. Oh, it's interesting that, um, yeah, there's so many threads to follow, really, when you start doing this. Yeah. And we, we wouldn't be able to get as far as we can now if John Miller hadn't done this sterling exercise of recording the memorial inscriptions back in 1995, because so many of those graves have vanished. Mm. They're not readable anymore. And also Rob Marley and um, what's the name from Blanton Cottage? Who, uh, oh, yeah. yeah, they all did so much work on uh, Jenny. Yeah, Jenny. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. Jenny Day. I mean, just uh, transcribing the um, the burial index, which makes it so much easier to find people. So. Any other thoughts? Any other questions for Sheila or Jackie? We, we've had a we've had Mark Gallup watching from afar. Oh yes. And he's just posted a memorial card uh, in loving memory of William Gallup of yes. Langdon, Somerset. He fell asleep March the 31st, Good Friday, 1899. Oh, that's wonderful. That's he, the one that's on here. in Blackburn Churchyard. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, that is exactly the one that we've got here. Yeah, it's brilliant. Oh, that is there nice. is actually a website which you can look on uh, called Find, Find a Grave. And and various people go around the country photographing graves in different churchyards and it'll tell you where they were, it'll tell you what the inscription is if they can, and it'll also give you links to other possible uh, members of the family, so it can be useful sometimes, but you can follow red herrings quite easily when it comes to names. <laughs> yeah. In fact, they have somebody has photographed a number of graves in Blagdon. They are on there. Certainly Thomas Rowers is on there. Various others. Yeah. Anyway, I think I'll probably speak for everybody when um, next time I walk past or through the graveyard, <laughs> I'm certainly going to be looking at it with uh, totally new and inspired eyes. I mean, it's a, I think she and Jackie really have brought it home to us that, uh, that they're not just cold slabs of stone, that there yeah. are people underneath and people's lives, and many of them, you know, quite fascinating. And uh, I, I think probably again, looking, dare I say, around the room and uh, all the grey hairs, including mine, how grateful we are living in our time, uh, <laughs> rather than when so many people died so young. Um, and remember, of course, that the people who could actually afford the sort of headstones we've been looking at weren't the basic farm labourers, the poor. They were probably relatively affluent, but still their children died. They died fairly young in many cases. So, uh, it brings it home to them, it? They certainly were some fascinating lives there. Um, I would really like to thank on your behalf, uh, Sheila and Jackie, for the amount of work that went into it. And I would, I think, just like emphasize probably just how much work did go into it looking at some of those slides. You know, the yeah, information isn't necessarily instantly available. And um, certainly, sort of having seen Sheila. It, it amidst the grass that was wrong in the churchyard. Yes, I was. <laughs> the, the agricultural implements trying to sort of get his way through. Um, it was a sterling effort. And uh, again, I'd like to thank you very much for being more uh, a very, very interesting presentation. Good. Thank you. Excellent. And tea and coffee is ready shortly. Yep. Yeah. I'll go back look at this map of Memphis. They shot very well, those um, slavings. Yeah, they did. Yeah. I tried the one with, with the three yeah. uh, cherubs, and it didn't, uh, didn't come out as well, uh, so I didn't have another one. Yeah. I'll have a look. there's a group of us